For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Can you hear me? My own? you'll bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege that we have, the freedom that we have to come and worship you, Lord, in this country. Lord, help us not to take those things for granted, but to use every bit of that freedom that we have every day to, to preach your message, Lord. Help us to be bold. Help us not to worry about the circumstances around us or anything, Lord, to be complacent or fear of suffering or anything else, but just to be bold with the gospel message because it is written upon our hearts and we can't help but tell others of the, the joy that we have of knowing Jesus Christ, of being redeemed, being set free, having no condemnation whatsoever, to know how amazing your love is. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Help us to hear the words. Um, from, from your word, Lord, and the Spirit apply them to our lives so that we'll be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Thank you for the time and the fellowship that we have together. Thank you for the Spirit uniting us as one body, and may we go out into this world and make a difference for your kingdom come, Lord, and your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this week, you should have read Psalms 140 to 150. You finished up Psalms. You should have finished up 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. You started the book of Judges, chapters 1 through 8. Man, we'll get to that more in a minute. And then you read John chapters 1 to 3. I want to read a few things from Psalms first. Psalms 40, verse 1, Rescue me, Lord. Are you born again? That's the name of my sermon title. Born again. What does that mean to you? If you are born again, you have heard... You have answered because God has heard your cry and answered your cry for help by offering salvation through Jesus Christ. And you have responded to that and you are a new creation in Christ. Is that the case? The old is gone then, the new has come. Your life is not your own. You are in this body, in this flesh to live like Christ in the world, united together as the body of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 said, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now, each and every day, now is the day of your salvation. I'll probably say this several times in the next upcoming weeks so that you get that through your head. Each and every day is the day that you're being saved you are saved, being saved, and then you will be forever redeemed, a new body in Christ. All of the things in this world that are heartaches and suffering and stuff will be gone. He'll wipe away every tear. Today is the day of your salvation, and let me remind you this, tomorrow is the day of your salvation. Well, I read from Psalms 140. How about Psalms 141 to 143? There was continued crying out to the Lord for salvation. And then if you didn't notice it, there's a change coming in the end of the Psalms. Psalms 144 verses 3 and 4 say, Lord, what are human beings that you care for them, mere mortals that you think of them? They are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. Yet God does care. He does hear you. He does answer. And he loves you enough to send his only son to die for your salvation. Have you heard him? Have you heard Jesus' call? Verse 9 of Psalms 144. I will sing a new song then to you, my God. On the ten-string lyre I will make music to you. It was good to see Debbie and Sherry singing like that with Polly, of course, too. But them turning the page together and working together because of their love for Jesus. 
Psalms 145 to 150 are praise songs. We end out the Psalms that way. With praise to God all through this book of Psalms, we see the frustration of man because we live in a fallen world and everything else. We see that we are stiff-necked, rebellious people, but we see a faithful, loving God. And Psalm 145, verse 1, begins this way, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Verse 10 through 12, all your works praise you. Lord, your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. And I'll say again, that was before anyone knew the name of Jesus Christ. How much more should you be praising him today? Today is the day of your salvation. Psalm 146 starts out this way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord with all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. All of my life, all of my soul for all eternity. Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. Verse 11. The Lord delights in those who fear Him, who put their hope in His unfailing love. Have you done that? Is your hope firmly grounded upon Jesus Christ? Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the sky. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at His command they were created. And He established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. All of creation praises God now and forevermore. What about you? Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, this song of salvation through Jesus Christ. And Psalm 50 rounds out the Psalms this way. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His unsurpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounds of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with a clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You're still breathing, aren't you? Go ahead. So let us praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll finish up Corinthians kind of easily. Do you have saving faith? That's what Paul was worried about time and time again with his church. There were, of course, those that had saving faith, but it kind of looks like uh, maybe even a majority of the church did not. Oh, yeah, on that day many will cry out, Lord, Lord, we did mighty works in your name, but he will say, depart from me, I don't know you. Many. The road is narrow and few find it. And it's harder for rich, which we are again, to get into the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of, the, of a needle. But with God, all things are possible. Is your, fir, is your foundation firmly planted on Jesus Christ? Not some type of prosperity gospel, not things that you boast about of your health and your wealth and everything else, but Paul tells you to boast about your weakness. Because when you're weak, you are strong because you're relying on God's power and His might then to find out just how strong you can be by how weak you can become. Because the least of these will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and in Judges, we read about that guy named um, Gideon who was very weak and very wishy-washy. Anyway, we'll get to him in a little bit. Uh, Paul goes on to say that he had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Maybe it was partial blindness, as a lot of people think, but who knows? He begged three times to God that it would be taken away. Jesus' answer, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. But see, the problem is, is we always think it's about us and our power and what we're going to do by our might. I know that because I face it every single day. I get up and say, here's what I'm going to do today, Lord. Paul's response, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. The church needed to hear this because they were so caught up in how good they could be, how great they could be. Like I said, it's kind of a prosperity gospel. I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that 
Christ's power may rest upon me. Come and fill me, subdue me, lift me up, because if I die with him, I will be raised to life with him. Verse 10, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecution and difficulties. Is that your response when difficulties and troubles come your way? Or is your go-to response, why, Lord, what's going on? Do you rely on your own mites rather than getting down on your knees and praying? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Oh, we're not guilty of any of those things, are we? I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. Is there anything that you need to repent of? Is there anything I need to repent of? Is there anything this church needs to repent of? Because without true repentance, you're not going to find true grace because you're holding on to the sins, the things that hold you captive in this world. So Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 and 6, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? How do you look like Jesus in this world, especially to your enemies, especially to the weak and the marginalized? Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Paul, in his weakness, in the labor of love that he has, has passed the test. Does our life look like Paul as he imitates Christ? 2 Corinthians 13, verses 11 through 14. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Did you catch that? Full restoration. Not partial restoration because I'm still holding on to things. Not because I rely on my will and my might sometimes and God's and other times when I really need Him when I cry out. Because I have cried out and cried out to God and He has heard me, period, in anything that I might suffer in this world. For He has given His Son to die for me. So therefore, nothing in this world, none of the things that we face, they're all light and momentary. I can know that my name is written in the book of life. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another then. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What the church should look like in the world. But Corinth was a place where the church struggled. Oh, so was the church in Ephesus. So was the church in Philippi. So was the churches in Bonish Ferry. So we have to remember that. and We have to be united together with the one spirit, humbling ourselves, being repentative, comforting one another, not thinking of ourselves, but thinking of others' needs over ourselves. Are we committed to doing that? So now let's go back into Israel's past and look at it. The time of Judges. Woo! I've got a video for you in a minute that I'm probably going to play. Judges. A time of Judges and of God's justice. A time also of His deliverance. Joshua led the people out of the promised land. And remember, the first generation didn't go into the promised land. Joshua, Yeshua, led them into the promised land as a, as a vision, a, a, a glimpse of what Jesus Christ would do for us now and forever in a land that we can't even describe with grapevines that you have to carry in but two men but a land of milk and honey that we cannot even fathom because Paul said that, that he... he whether it was in a vision or real or whatever, he saw a glimpse of heaven and he could not utter the things that he saw. They were indescribable. John tries to describe some of the things he saw in Revelation. We can't even hardly understand his, his words. God has prepared a place for you that you have no idea how good it's going to be. And we'll be praising him for that. But instead they went through the cycle where they turned to idols because they failed to drive out, they failed to repent 
They failed to trust the Lord their God and long back for the gods that they had served before. They intermarried even and took on new gods and new idols. You know, that's the human life cycle of unrepented sin where we say that we want to be forgiven, but we still hold on to that desire. And we say, because of our own power, I can't quit doing this. Uh, this sin just has a hold on me. No, it doesn't. All of those chains are broken. Jesus Christ has freed you completely as long as you will let him do it. Oh, that's hard to, 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 to even think about saying everything. You're right, it is when you think on a human scale again. But you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, dead. It died with Jesus on the cross. So Jesus, so God uh, set up judges that would show the people their sin and as you read, the people changed when the judge was there. But if you look at the judge, the judge seems to just as corrupt as the people, doesn't he? Just as wishy-washy, just as, as fallible. Huh. Let's call that the human cycle. Without Jesus in your life, you're going to continue to fall, get up, fall, get up, fall, get up. But know that you don't have to fall. And John writes that if you do fall, you have an advocate in heaven. Repent and turn to Jesus. So are you following Jesus as your King and Lord, not just claiming Him as a Savior? There's a big difference. How does this life cycle that we read about in Judges, how does it look in the church today? Judges begins this way in Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who of us is going to go up first and fight against the Canaanites? Who of us? We're relying on our own strength. Yes, God works through His people, but it's His might and His power, not ours. The Lord answers, Judah shall go up. I have given. Don't miss that. I have given the land into their hands. Do you think Judah could have gone up without them and done anything? Well, if you read on, you know that they couldn't. It's not by our righteousness, not by our might, anything else. God uses, uses us in his weakness, in our weakness. Judges 1.19, the Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country. But, there's that word, that other side, complete opposite, can be the greatest thing in the world. For all have sinned. But God gives the glorious gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This but's not so good. The Lord was with the men of Judah, so they should have had complete victory. They took possession of the hill country. What about the valleys? What about those low places? But they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. Now, if you read this at first, you'll just say, oh, well, they didn't have enough strength to defeat the iron chariots. Of course they didn't. They didn't have enough strength to defeat whatever that was up in the hill country. It was by God's power and by God's might that they were able to deliver. But they feared men in their chariot. Or they longed for whatever it was. Whatever the reason was because their heart wasn't wholly committed to God like Joshua and Caleb. They failed to drive out the, the people in the plains. And that pattern repeats over and over again because we just settle and say this is okay. This is okay in our community. This is okay in our church. We're not going to fight about this. What can we do about this anyway? Oh, it's going to take more time and more energy than I have. What, whatever those things are. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you up. And I led you into the land that I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Oh, I've seen a lot of eyes at first, and I saw some yous in that. Eyes is God, and he took care of everything that he said he would because he's faithful. But what about the yous? You shall not make a covenant with the people of this land. Hmm. You shall break down their altars. Uh, I believe, God bless America, there's more idols in this country than there ever, ever has been. And they're more popping up every single minute of every single day. We need a church. We need a people that will stand up for Jesus Christ. Yet you have dis disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said I will not drive... 
I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their God will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bochum, which means weeping. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. There's that cycle again where there's not true repentance. We weep because we see these things going on in our life. And we say, oh, Lord, we cry out to him and we worship him. But where are we right down the road from that? Are we back in that sinful cycle? Sin has no power in your life. It has no place in your life. You are sanctified, made holy, set apart for Jesus Christ, period. Was there true repentance? Without true repentance, is there true faith? Will it be proved by the fruit that you produce and how you love one another, how you give up your life, how you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus? With Israel, the answer was no. There was not true repentance. What about the church in Corinth? It doesn't appear they're headed that way. What about you and I? Is there true repentance? Do you love God enough for the great gift that He's given to you that you work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Judges chapter 2, verse 13. Because they forsook him and served Baal and Ashtoreth, in his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. Hmm. Where is your strength going to come from now? Where is your might? The hope that you have built your, your confidence on. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel would go out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Oh, if we just looked at the spiritual battle that we're fighting, the powers and principalities that we're fighting, all the darkness in this world that, oh yeah, we're going to get to John chapter 1, aren't we? That the light has come into the world so that it may extinguish the darkness. When Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to do by the choices that they made by not being a wholly set-apart people. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Prostitution, relationship that you should have had that is intimate. Instead, you went out and you were unfaithful. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's command. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hand of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. What do you think the cycle is like when you continue in sin? You get deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. But the thing is, at any point you can say, Jesus, release me and mean it and repent and fall on your knees and turn to Him. And the old is gone. Gone. Completely gone. They followed other gods and served and worshipped them. They refused to give up their evil practice and their stubborn ways. So I've got a video coming up in just a minute. But I want you to think about this when we're looking at this video. It's about judges, and you're going to read more in Judges. I want you to think about what the judges point to Jesus Christ. And a life of sin in this world, the world that we live in today, the sins and things that you struggle with just the same, and how that points to Jesus Christ and deliverance and light so that your light may shine. Because if your light is not shining, it may be because there's still something darkness in there but yet light came into the world to, dis to extinguish the light and judges you're going to read about Othniel, Ehud, or we read about Othniel, Ehud Shamgar, Deborah and Jael and Gideon and this video explains a little bit of, about them it tells you a little bit about Othniel why did God raise up a woman judge is it because men weren't standing up as much you, if you read that it's pretty obvious that's the case this is the cycle of life that does not need to be repeated because of salvation and freedom in Jesus Christ. You repent, you believe, you trust, you live, and you praise God not with just your words, not with your lips that are far from, but with a heart that is new, 
a heart and a mindset that is Jesus Christ, that doesn't care about the things of this world, that just loves God, loves what, what that Jesus has done for them, and loves others just as Jesus has done. The power of sin is broken, and the power to live has come. But it's only found when you're weak that you can find the power of resurrected life. So what about you and your relationship with Jesus? Are you ready, Logan?
read Judges, I'm on, without the lens of Jesus, you just see all this darkness in the world. <laughs> but you know that your sins won't be judged for what you've done because Jesus took that judgment upon himself. Wow. Are you working out your salvation each and every day because you have been forgiven? You have been redeemed. You have been adopted as God's child. The new is here. So what about you and Jesus? How is your light shining? You made it through Gideon is where you made it. And if you remember, oh, Paul talked about uh, um, fragile clay jars and the, and the precious gift that was in them. And Gideon went out with the 300 men to camels as vast as grains of sand and, and men, and they broke those ordinary clay jars and the light shined through, and the men killed themselves. They didn't even have to take up a sword against them there. Wow, if just you would in your weakness let that fragile clay jar be broken so that the light of Jesus could shine through you. Have you truly planted, repented, truly believed, truly followed Jesus as King and Lord? Then how is the light shining in and through you? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. All understanding, all, everything that we have of written language, understanding everything else, especially to know truth. And this world talks about so many ways of finding truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Oh, this is kind of like where uh, God talked about all the things He did for them concerning Israel. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. All that life was, the, and that life was the light of all mankind. So we've had word, 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 and him, 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 putting, putting flesh on the word itself to be light. The light was made, the light shines in the darkness, sorry, and the darkness has not overcome. There was a man sent for, from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So we have understanding and truth, word, 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 in the name of Jesus, coming into this world to be light to this world. Verse 10, he was in the world, and through, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but he, his own did not rec receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born of not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband will, but born of God. Born anew, children of light. It means born from above instead of just born again because you're, you're not the same anymore. You don't have the bonds of sin anymore. The light has shined down from heaven, the understanding and truth to shine through you as long as you'll let your fragile clay jar, ordinary pottery be broken and set aside so that Jesus can shine through you. So what about you and Jesus? I ask it again. Have you truly repented, truly believed, truly followed Jesus as King and Jesus as Lord? then how is the light shining in and through you? How many ways are you doing that? Are you doing it each and every day? Are you doing it as much as you possibly can? Oh, are there some ways that you know that you should that you're not? How, light, how bright is the light shining into the darkness or is some darkness still there that is keeping the light from coming through? Jesus said, come and follow me. Leave everything else behind forsake it all, which is what the disciples did, left their livelihood, everything else, and followed in his footsteps, learning from him as rabbi and teacher so that they could be like him. And then in John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
That wasn't just for the disciples then. Heaven has been opened up. The veil has been torn and you are in the most holy of holies. Your Scripture says you're already seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms, Ephesians 2, 6. Are you living like you are a citizen of heaven or are you living like you still are a citizen here on earth? John chapter 2, verse 1, On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, have you ever thought about why it goes from the calling of the disciples after Jesus coming into the world and being light so that we can be light? Why do we go to this wedding feast in Canaan? Jesus' first miracle, not just the first one recorded in John, but his first miracle that we know about in his public ministry. Why? Who cares if wine ran out at the wedding? Well, I do when it's a wedding for Jesus and his bride. <laughs> I care that there's wine all the time because I'm celebrating. I'm not worried about the things of this world. I can boast in all of my sufferings and everything else. The wedding celebration had just begun. And if you read and notice that, the water was not turned into wine until people acted upon it whether they had the faith on it or not. But it says this, it says, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, ceremonial cleaning, cleansing jars, because we don't need that anymore. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. Okay, but we don't know when that happened exactly. He didn't realize where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The servants drew water, and when they drew it, as they were bringing it up, it turned into wine before the master of the ceremonies tasted it. It took an act of faith, <laughs> just a mustard seed faith, to go in and pour. Because what in the world were those servants? Did they trust Jesus? I don't know, but they trusted him enough to do what he said. Maybe it was because Mary said, do what he said. Maybe that's what it was. If Sherry said, do what he said, instead of Alan, you guys would probably jump more. <laughs> but they did it. And because they did it, a miracle happened. So how many times have we missed miracles because we didn't do what we needed to do to see the miracle happen? John chapter 2, verse 9, Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. If you're trying to hold on to the, what you think is the old wine, you're an idiot because you're holding on to things that entangle you and bring you down rather than having freedom in Christ. I know it's tough. I face it every single day. I think of my own things. I think of my own comfort and, and, and oh, money is, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, we need money to survive. We need a place to live. Everything else, what Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to come and follow me, I don't have a place to lay my head. Do you trust God that much? doesn't mean he'll take it away from you, but do you trust him that much? Do you love him more than you love your family and everything? Do you trust them? Even if they walk away, will you continue to pray for them, like Barry said, for our grandchildren? Will you pray and pray and pray, and will you live like Christ in this world, trusting God to do his part, which he's faithful to do that? But he also works through the effective, fervent prayer of righteous people. <clears throat> What Jesus did here in Cana and Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. I mean, that's something, turning water into wine. That's huge. But it revealed his glory because it was so much more than turning water into wine. It was telling you that if you believe you are married into Jesus, into this relationship, you are adopted into God's family. You see the glory of God and it is revealed through you if you live for him. Come celebrate. Today is the day of your salvation. So will tomorrow be. And so will all of eternity. Then Jesus clears the temple of hypocrisy. And there's money exchanging going on. Huh. The love of money instead of love for God. I trust in money more than I trust in God. And I'm a hypocrite because I praise Him with my mouth, but my heart is not there where it needs to be. Hmm. Do you have any idols that need to be cleared? Any tables that need to be turned? so that you can worship with true worship and praise, worship with everything, all of your body, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Oh, yeah, and don't forget that will lead to loving your neighbor as yourself. 
John chapter 3. Oh, we can't start in John chapter 3. I know that your Bible has chapters and divisions, and that's great, and it has little headers on some of them that tells you what's going on. But the story of Nicodemus starts in verse 23 of John chapter 2. Okay? doesn't start in John chapter 3. Now while he was in Jerusalem, this is John chapter 2, verse 23. At the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he performed, and they believed in his name. Woohoo! They're saved. Let's read on. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. Oh, I believe that you're a prophet. I know that you come from God. I see the signs that you... Oh, I'm talking about Nicodemus, isn't it, if we read on. But that was what the crowds did. They came and followed Jesus so that he could give them physical bread, but they sure didn't want the bread of heaven that came down. They wanted to be healed of their infirmities and everything, but that's so they could go live their own life and not miss out on things they'd missed out on before. It wasn't so that they could forsake all and go follow Jesus. Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. That's why he came, to take the sin from them, to take the judgment upon himself. Now... There was a Pharisee, a man called Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. Remember that thing about the light? Remember the thing with Gideon and the light shining? Remember that thing in Matthew uh, in the Sermon on the Mount about letting your light shine? G Nicodemus came at night. Knowing who Jesus was, knowing that no one could do that unless God had sent him, but he came at night as to not be exposed because it would cost him something. The rest of the religious hypocrites would persecute him, maybe even kill him. But he knew that Jesus was someone from God. Now there was a, member, now there was a Pharisee, a man called Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Ooh, high up on that too. I might lose my prestige and stuff. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi. That, that means that he was willing to learn from him, but yet we weren't. You say, Jesus, I'm willing to take you on as Savior, but are you willing to take him on as Lord? Rabbi, we know, <laughs> even the rest of the Pharisees maybe, we believe that you are a teacher who came from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. He believed, he saw, but he was not willing to let the light come in and extinguish the darkness. So Jesus replied in verse 3, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. There you go. There's that born again. What does that mean? We see what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you can just come to light and say, I know Jesus. I know God. I believe that God is real. I believe Jesus died. Is he Lord? Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not a good pro prophet, not a, not, a, not a friend. Lord of everything. God created you. That's why I read the Psalms and things first. And the sun and moon and stars obey and proclaim the glory of God. But do you, O oh human... And what, is, what are human beings that are God is even mindful of them? But yet He is. Because He created you, He loved you, and in your sin and shame, He sent Jesus Christ to die to take that from you. Give it all to Him. It's not that Nicodemus didn't understand. He understood. But he didn't want to humble himself. He didn't want to repent. Verse 4, so he goes with this argument, kind of like the woman at the well coming up. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. He, he wasn't serious when he said that. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. He was having a conversation with a rabbi and he goes to this nonsense. <laughs> Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What does that mean? 
Born from above, born of the Spirit of God. If you have been, if you have truly believed, then you are a new creation in Christ and God dwells in you. So are you walking in step with the Spirit? Are you producing the fruits of the Spirit? Do you realize the gifts that you have of the Spirit? Are you a light to this world? And I could go on and on and on and on, but I don't think you won't be too that long. You should not be surprised at this saying. Nicodemus knew the Old Testament. He dwelled on being a religious zealot, but his heart was far from God. He wanted salvation. He was a religious sect that, that believed in uh, resurrection of the dead, but yet he didn't want to repent. He didn't want to lose his status, his money. He didn't want to feel the shame of other men. He feared men, whatever the things were that kept him. So Jesus said, you must be born again, and he described it this way. The wind blows where it pleases. Is the wind blowing out there right now? I don't hear it. I don't see it much. Do you? So I'm going to say the wind isn't blowing out there right now. Is that a good enough assumption? Because if the wind was blowing, the doors are open there, we'd hear something. We'd feel something. We'd see something. Oh, I'm sorry. What about Jesus in your life? What Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. You're not born again unless you feel the Spirit of God moving in you. Trying to get you to turn completely to Him. To be fully reconciled. You were the day that God said, I accept you because of His Son's death. Do you realize that? It's like the wind, guys. You don't have to know about meteorology effects and things like that. You just simply know if I hear wind, I know there's wind there. But especially how I know it is not hearing it because you're proclaiming Jesus Christ. It's because how you're making things move with what you're doing. As you continue on reading in Judges, look at how it points to Jesus. As you continue reading John's hear the I am's of Jesus who he is he's calling out to you so that you don't live a life of regret or remorse that you live a life fully committed to him and you see miracles happen as a result because you're letting the wind blow you and move you wherever he pleases because you know without a doubt that you're born again Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your wonderful, amazing grace, for this gift of salvation, that through my weakness I could see your strength, that I could know that if I am faithful and true that I can count on all of your promises, that I will pray fervently for my children and my grandchildren and for the wrongs in this world, that I will grow to hate sin but, but have compassion for those who are sinners because they don't know you so that I will live my life not only proclaiming, especially not proclaiming hypocrisy, but proclaiming and doing so that others might be saved just as Paul did with his life. For he considered everything else rubbish and gar garbage. But he sought after to running this race and running it not in vain, but running it where it would make a difference, that he would even give up his salvation if that could mean that he could save others, but he can't. So he'll just keep on what he's doing and loving and living and proclaiming Jesus Christ until he dies. So that his life would be a pleasant, pleasing aroma to you. We just thank you and praise you for the gift of Jesus Christ. The spirit that we have that, that seals us as your own and unites us together as your body. May we serve you with everything that we have as individuals and as his church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.